mute that. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I appreciate your patience as we uh, get through some of this technical difficulty. Uh, obviously, whenever we are learning uh, on Zoom, we're, we're, we're in a whole new ball game. But uh, it is definitely a pleasure to be here. I want to uh, introduce myself. I'm Joshua Ball. I'm the college minister with Buckeyes for Christ. Uh, it's an outreach ministry with the Fissinger and Kenny Church of Christ in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I want to offer a warm welcome to everybody that's here. Uh, we've got <laughs> probably several hundred uh, by the RSVPs here tonight. Uh, we want to offer a warm welcome, especially to uh, college students that are here at Ohio State. I, I know some other college ministries are also uh, presenting this. I know Tide for Christ down in Alabama, uh, as well as Light for Christ uh, down in uh, in Athens. But uh, we want to thank you all for coming. And uh, even if you're not a college student, we are glad that you're here uh, tonight. Um, please make sure that you stop by our church if you're ever coming through the area. But this evening, we are very pleased to be able to present uh, Melvin Ote to speak on the Christian's response to, uh, to racism. This uh, presentation is going to be in three sections, 20 minutes, followed by a 10-minute section of Q&A. Uh, there is a Q&A uh, option down below if you want to submit questions there or send them to b4cministry at gmail.com, and we will be able to get those questions as we go along. But uh, enough of me talking here. Let me present Melvin Ote to you here. Melvin received his formal education from St. Louis University, uh, his BSBA in 1997, Howard University School of Law, he got his JD in 2000, Amherst University, and he got his BS in Ministry and Bible in 2008, and an MDiv in Ministerial Leadership in 2014. He has served as an associate professor of law at Faulkner University, Jones School of Law, since August 2014. He writes for Christian publications and speaks frequently in Christian meetings, lectures, and seminars. He and his family worship and work in Montgomery, Alabama. Melvin, thank you very much for being here. All right, Joshua, thank you. Uh, glad to be with you guys this evening. Appreciate so much uh, the interest in having the conversation as we are always seeking to uh, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I mean, these are sometimes the kind of things that people don't enjoy uh, talking about, but uh, there's no way to help make things better, no way to grow, no way to make improvements without discussing where we are. And uh, that's where we want to begin tonight. As Joshua said, we've got in mind sort of three segments to our discussion. And so what I'll try to do is present certain information or certain thoughts, and I hope that you will ask your questions. And so I'll present a little information and then take a break, and, and I'd love to interact with you. So if you do have questions, uh, I ask you to, uh, to please go ahead and ask those. These are interesting times uh, that we live in. Uh, in some respects, people would say, you know, they're sort of unprecedented times, and I think there is an element of that. Uh, but the truth is, they're not altogether unprecedented. We have been here before. And so I think it's important for us to think about where we are. And in order to move forward, you have to first understand where you are, where you've been, where you're supposed to be, and then you can sort of do the work that's necessary to move forward. I was uh, having a discussion with a friend uh, this was probably a couple of years ago now, but we were talking about at that time some of the racial tensions that exist in the church and in society. And uh, at one point he says to me, can't we just move forward? And uh, I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way, right? At a certain point, you get tired of talking about these things. You get tired of thinking about these things. And I would personally love to move forward. Uh, but when he said that to me or when he asked me that, I asked him this question what are we moving forward from? And I don't know that he had ever thought about it quite like that, right? So he paused for a bit and then um, he told me something like, well, from the past, we wanna move forward from everything that's happened. And so then I turned to him again and I said, well, will you please explain to me as best as you understand what has happened? And he couldn't really answer. See, I think that's a pretty important question. How do you move forward 
when you don't know where you are? How do you move forward when you don't really understand how you have gotten to the place where you are? So for this initial part of our discussion, that's what I want to think about. I want to think a little bit about how we got here because in 2020, you know, America didn't just, uh, you know, when we were born, America wasn't a blank slate. Uh, there were certain things that have happened. There's a certain dynamic, there's a certain culture, there's a certain history that exists in the country. And listen, all of us were born into that. We didn't create it, but you know what? We live in it and it does affect us. And so we do need to have an understanding of that. And for people uh, who are people of faith, you know, those who have named Christ and those who are doing their best to live good and godly lives, the same is true in the church. Now we can see certain dynamics in the church and uh, we should understand that these things have all emerged from a certain background and in a certain context. So that's what I want to uh, visit with you for just a few moments about in our first discussion. All right, first thing, if you read your Bible, you read in the New Testament, you see the church begins in Acts chapter two. Well, when the church began, it did not come into a world that didn't have a history, right? The church began in the country of Israel and Israel had its history and it also had a history of dealing with the nations all around it. So it was born into a certain context and that context included racial tension, racial turmoil, right? The Jews did not get along with the Samaritans. The Jews did not get along with the Gentiles. There had been histories of fightings and people uh, committing atrocities against one another. And so there, was, there were racial tensions in the world and those racial tensions affected the early church. I would say to you, the same thing is true of the church in America today, right? America has its own racial history. And if you look at what's happening in the church today, well, the church was born in America in the context of racial tension and turmoil. Race hate and bigotry has been a part of American culture since before America was even a country. I mean, before the Declaration of Independence. Um, slavery, and I know sometimes people don't really love to uh, even think about it or talk about it, but listen, slavery existed in America for about 250 years. And of course that predates the Declaration of Independence. Uh, if you do the research on this, what you'll find is that in about, they usually will use August of 1619 as the time when the first African slaves uh, came into the Americas. Now we know that there were African slaves here before that, but they used August of 1619, and that was in Jamestown, Virginia. 1619. So by the time the colonists rebelled against England in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence and all, by that time, slavery in what would become America was already firmly entrenched. Now, why do I mention this? I mention it because when you had the Declaration of Independence and you had all those founding documents and then you had the U.S. Constitution, which was ratified in 1787, when you read some of the statements like all men are created equal and all of that, um, that did not apply to all men. I mean, in America's context, um, people who were of African descent were not fully human beings. And you can see that in the Constitution. There's three places in the uh, US Constitution where slavery is referenced. Three times in the Constitution of the United States, I'm talking about the, the, the original articles, not even the amendments, the original articles, three times slavery is mentioned. So this is part of what America has always been. It's part of what America was before it became its own nation and it's part of what America was when it founded itself as a nation. So among other things, I mentioned the three references there in the Constitution. It says, you know, for purposes of representation, uh, representation and taxation, that free people, which in the context would be white folks, would, be, would count as a person, and then uh, all other people, all other persons, persons of African descent would, be, would count as three-fifths of a person. That's what they call the three-fifths rule, okay? There's another uh, reference in there where it basically says that uh, after 1808, the importation of certain persons, this is the slave trade, 
the importation of certain persons could be outlawed, but if people continue to import certain persons after that time, then they would be taxed. And so this just announced that when black people came to the country as slaves, that a tax would be levied for that purpose. And then there's another place where it specifically says that if a person were a slave and they escaped from a slave state to a free state, um, they would no longer be free. They, 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 before that, it was that if a person was in a slave state and they escaped and they got to a free state, they would be free. But this provision in the uh, Constitution said no. So then if a person wanted to be free, okay, they couldn't be free in America. They'd have to escape to Mexico or escape to Canada. Okay, why do I mention that? I'm just telling you that the things that we're seeing and the things that we're hearing in the news and the things that people are upset about and the things that people are marching about and things that people are some tech cases fighting about, these are not new things. Okay, we've had the, the current president that we have is the 45th president, I believe. And uh, we've had at least 12 presidents of the United States, which is more than one fourth who were at one time or another slave owners. This is part of what America's always been, okay? Uh, at least eight of those people owned slaves while they were in office. Now, I want you to think about what happened, and I want you to think for a moment about why, okay? Because we've gone from 1619 and come past the uh, U.S. Constitution in 1787. Why is all this happening? How did all of this happen? Well, part of what went on, part of what went on, and there's economic reasons and other stuff, but part of what went on was that people used a bastardized form of Christianity to uh, justify enslaving people of African descent. Now, there are certain verses that they would turn to and they'd say, well, listen, this says that slavery is okay, and it specifically says that these people uh, should be slaves, and so they taught that it was biblical, it was good, to enslave people. And that gave some people uh, the sort of, I don't know, the support that they needed in order to do what they wanted to do anyway. Now, it's also important to remember that we had this bastardized form of Christianity and people uh, oftentimes said that uh, slavery was sort of being advanced with the Bible and the gun. Now that did happen. But you also had something else that was going on. You had religious people teaching that some people were subhuman. And you also had teachings of people like Charles Darwin and the origin of the species. Now that book um, was published in 1859. And that book, of course, taught essentially the whole point of the book was that some people are less evolved than other people and that it is the job of the more evolved people to dominate and subjugate the lesser peoples. And so it was really a book about justifying why racism and uh, classism and all that was, was acceptable. All right, you come to 1865. 1865 is the end of the Civil War. It is when we had the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which is uh, emancipating or freeing the slaves. So our country, right, before it was a country, had this, this tension about I'm gonna just use the shorthand here, black people, white people. And that played out for about 250 years, 250 years until 1865. And the country went to war over this. Now, some folks, um, I hear the discussions would kind of like to uh, reimagine the Civil War and maybe romanticize it a little bit. Um, but I would just say to you, you can read you can read what the states that succeeded said their reasons for going to war were. There's something called the declarations of clauses of causes of the seceding states. And so the individual states, they published their reasons for seceding from the union and they mentioned slavery dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Okay. This is what it was about. So 250 years, it took America to settle the question, of slavery, and that was settled about 150 years ago. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's a long time ago. Well, I don't know how long that ago that is really, right? It was 150 years ago, but it lasted for 250 years. 
and the thinking and the dynamics and the values that led people to justify it for as long as they did, um, that didn't vanish when the North won the Civil War, all right? So 1865 or so. During this time, it's important to note that remember, uh, people were using, and I will tell you that they were misusing the Bible, misusing Christianity, and I could prove that to you if anybody had any questions about it, but, but they were using Christianity to justify slavery. And it was built upon this idea that some people are superior to other people. Some people are fully human and created in the image of God, and then some people are not. And you had Darwin and people like him and ideas like that that were also supporting it. So when slavery ended, that didn't go away. For the next 100 years, from about 1865 until the 1960s or so, you had 1950s or 60s, you had what's called Reconstruction. Slavery had ended, but this was a new era uh, in the relations of the black folks and white folks to races in America. And it was uh, a pretty bloody area, a uh, bl bloody era. You had thousands of people in the South who were being killed, uh, upwards of 4,000 men, women, and children who were hanged, public lynchings and so forth. Um, during this period of time, you had uh, a series of race riots all throughout the, U the United States. And of course, we don't read about this stuff in our uh, textbooks very much, but this, these things absolutely happened. And uh, you could, of course, look these things up today. You could look these things up on the internet pretty easily, right? New Orleans in 1866, uh, Opelousas, Louisiana in 1868, Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, Atlanta, Georgia uh, in 1906 was a pretty infamous um, massacre and riot. Uh, East St. Louis, Illinois, which is very, very close to where I'm from. It's part of the metro area where I was born in 1917, destroyed just the whole town. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. Rosewood, Florida, 1923. Um, and these things were happening, these lynchings and these massacres and these race riots. These things were happening for, for most of us, we would say, were pretty insignificant reasons. Things like people attempting to vote or a perceived slight or offense, like somebody looking at someone else in the eye. Uh, this was a hundred years where people were losing their lives and folks were not being sort of prosecuted for that. Um, where people were being told, you know, where they could live and where they could work and what kind of job they could have. You had uh, laws in these states called black codes uh, that basically made it unlawful for black people to vote or to have certain kinds of jobs or to go to school or to bear arms or to gather for worship. Um, so the a lot of times people will say, well, slavery ended a long time ago. And well, it, it ended 150 years ago after 250 years. But um, the Reconstruction period, well, that was another 100 years of very, very dark time. And that only ended in like the 1960s. Hey, there are probably some people listening in right now who were alive and well and remember the 1960s. The 1960s was a very turbulent time in American history, very turbulent time. So you had people who after all of this history that I've just kind of summarized very briefly, you had people who were uh, protesting and saying, no, you know what? People of African descent are whole human beings and entitled to be fully respected and fully treated as equals. And we should be able to live anywhere we can afford to live. And when we get on a bus, we should be able to sit in any seat that we pay for, you know, Rosa Parks. And you had by and large, a peaceful, nonviolent civil disobedience that was protesting this long history of race problems in America. And of course, you know, Martin Luther King was sort of the uh, key figure, at least the figurehead. There were lots of key people. He was the key figure publicly. And um, he was assassinated in 1968 before his 40th birthday. So I'm 
I'm older than Martin Luther King was when he died. Um, and today we celebrate Martin Luther King, right? We, we sort of look at him as a hero. Well, during his lifetime, he was public enemy number one. Why do I tell you these things? We don't live in the 1600s. We don't live in the 1700s, 1800s. We don't even live in the 1900s anymore. The 1960s, it wasn't all that long ago, but we don't live in the 1960s. Why do I mention that? Well, because the vestiges of all of these problems, all of these things, this long history, which goes back now about some 500 years in America, what is now America, the vestiges of that are still with us. And I won't drag you through it, but we still have problems with these kinds of dynamics. And this is what you see playing out in the news, right? Where you see um, unarmed black males, at least this is what's getting the most attention, unarmed black males being killed by police officers, um, where you see sometimes, I don't know how many people are aware of it, but you see the statistics about mass incarceration and you hear complaints about that in the 1980s. You had this uh, disparity being introduced about uh, certain drugs over other drugs and how that led to this proliferation of incarceration of mostly black males. So what you see today, the tension that you see in society it's not a flash in the pan. This is something that has always been a part of America. And this now is the time for us, just because we were born into it, to wrestle with it, to confront it, and to try to deal with it. We didn't create these problems, right? Most of us had nothing to do with the creation of the issues, but here they are. And so we have to make a decision about what we're going to do, who we're going to be. It's been 500 years. It's been however you want to start with the county since 1776, if you want to use that date. But here we are. Now question, American society, of course, has its issues. But see where I started, the church in America was born into this country with these issues. And these issues have certainly uh, affected the church. You know, where was the church during all of this when slavery was going on? Well, you know, you had some people who were saying that slavery was bad, that it was uh, not a Christian thing to do and that it ought to be outlawed. But you also had some people with the Bible in their hand saying it was good and needed to be continued and uh, that they were willing to fight to maintain it. Where was the church after slavery ended? And you deal with Jim Crow laws and the black codes and forced segregation and all that. Well, listen, you had some people who were saying, well, this isn't right, this isn't okay. But you had some people, Bible in hand, who were saying, no, this is good and it is right. And they were supportive of separation or segregation and all the things that went along with that. So there's this mixed history in the church. Um, and everybody, listen, everybody who has a Bible is not a Christian. And everything every Christian says is not necessarily right. But it certainly does make for some confusion. It certainly does make things more difficult when people who claim to know Christ live and conduct themselves the way the world does. Racism is not a distinctly American phenomenon, it's not. Uh, but we live in America, and this is where we have to live out our faith and where we have to raise our children. And so this is the immediate sphere in which we have a responsibility to do what we can to make things better. So uh, I'm gonna pause now. I just wanted to kind of lay out uh, a brief framework. The first question is, how did we get here? Well, it's taken us 500 years, and here we are. And uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions anybody wants to ask me about this first part of our discussion. All right, Melvin, I appreciate this first part. Uh, and we've got a lot of questions here. We're not going to be able to get through all of them. Uh, I, I, we would be here literally all night. And Melvin, I know you've been teaching all day, too, on top of all of this. So yeah, all, right. all the more reason why we're glad you're here. Uh, 
please make sure that you send in some questions down below uh, in the Q&A section, and we will try to do our best to get to those. Uh, one question, you talked about uh, the uh, people using the Bible and, and using Bible verses incorrectly or, or things like that. Do you have any specific examples that you know of uh, where people have used the Bible in an incorrect way to support racism or racist actions? Yeah, if you'll, oh, yeah, if, okay, so there's, there's several, and I can't call them all to mind right off the top of my head, but if you look through the Old Testament, um, you'll find that God was regulating slavery there in Egypt, I mean, in Israel, right? So that's part of what people will use is they'll say, well, wait a minute. I mean, God didn't say that slavery was, was wrong. He regulated slavery, okay? And so that's one of the things people will say. And there's a few things you could observe about that. I mean, the first thing is um, God was regulating something that already existed, right? It wasn't as if he sort of ordained that this is what Israel should do. This is the way the world was already functioning. And he placed some humane limits on the way people would treat their slaves. Now, the way we use the word slave today, because of our context, which is chattel slavery, the, 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 the people who are in bondage are not human beings, they're cattle, they are property. That's not the way you see slavery being depicted throughout the Bible, right? It's more like what we would call indentured servitude. Now, we know that's true because you can see in your Bible when God is talking to Israel, he would say that the people would be released at certain periods of time, right? After so many years of service, maybe they incurred a debt, and at some point, their debt would be forgiven. And the basis for their being enslaved was not their genealogy, right? The basis for it wasn't the color of their skin or who their father was it would be because of some conduct that they had engaged in, maybe some debt they had incurred, or maybe they lost a war. Um, but it wasn't a perpetual thing where they were being dehumanized because of it. Now, how do I know that? Why would I say that? Well, part of what you would see is that slaves in your Old Testament could intermarry with the people to whom they were indebted. I mean, they became part of the family. If you remember Abraham, uh, when he's asking for a son, he says to God that my heir is going to be my servant born in my house because he didn't have any children. One of his slaves, one of his servants was going to inherit everything that he had. And he was a very rich man. Um, one of the uh, episodes I do think is pretty helpful is uh, you'll remember when uh, Lot was taken and Abraham had the battle with the uh, five and four kings as a result of that. Let me see here. I know I can lay my hands on this one here. Uh, that's back in the book of Genesis here. I don't know. Uh, maybe you can help me with that real quick, Joshua, so I can keep talking. It's in the early part of Genesis before uh, Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed in Genesis 19. But, um, but what happens there is that Abraham, uh, Lot is captured by the four kings who had come to fight against the five kings of the plain. And Abraham arms the servants in his house. He arms them and they went and fought against those kings and they captured Lot and brought everything back. Well, Abraham wasn't like, this wasn't a slave holder the way that we know slavery in America. This was a, a very wealthy man who provided for other people. They were in his employ. So he was responsible for their care and their upkeep and their provision, it was not. It was not like he had to subjugate them and the, the atrocities that went on in America. That's not what Abraham was doing. Nothing like that. Were you able to find that chapter that I was looking for? I know what you're talking about. It's before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, that's because just, it was. I, find it. I just I was trying not to. Uh, yeah, no, because it was uh, what, chapter fourteen. It's in chapter 14. 14. All right. Yep. So anyway, look at, and that's just an example of it. Uh, there's, there's several things. When you compare and contrast slavery um, in the Old Testament, it's not what you saw in America. The one time that I can know, that I can know for sure, is like, more like what we saw in America, is what Pharaoh did to yep. Israel, okay, uh, when you get to the beginning of the book of Exodus. And I think we all come to the same conclusion that God was not okay with that. Right. I mean, he, he wrecked Egypt for that. 
He judged Egypt for that. But that's the closest thing you'll see in the Bible to what we had in, in America. Is that literally dehumanizing? Um, well, that's right. And, you know, just the genocide and all that. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it, it, it really is very similar in description to what we saw uh, in the United States. Mm. Uh, we got one more question here uh, before before it's uh, time for our next section here. Uh, right. Justin has got a question here, so he's right. gonna he's gonna sit here and ask. Hey, so I'm Justin. I'm a college student here with Buckeyes for Christ, and hey, specifically as um, I was going through school as a kid, we were off, often taught that you know people like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks were heroes for the activism that they did, specifically. What is a Christian's place in this activism? Should Christians be a part of it? And how can we go about doing that? Okay, so are you asking just generally, should Christians participate in calling out injustices and things like that in society? Or are you asking how they might do it? I would say just generally, should we to begin? Okay, so um, I do intend to maybe say a little more about this later, but here's what I'll mention right now. Um, there's several places in the Bible where God calls his people to speak up on behalf of people who don't have a voice to speak for themselves, to, to speak up for the oppressed, to speak up for widows and orphans and people who are being taken advantage of. If people are not in a position to speak for themselves and they are being mistreated and abused and things like that, God expects righteous people to say something about it. Now, one of the examples, I'll, uh, one of the three places, and there are others, but I'll just mention this one while we're here, is uh, Proverbs chapter 30. In Proverbs chapter 30, and uh, let's see here. Ah, verse number eight. Open your mouth for the dumb or the mute people who can't speak. In, in the cause of all such as are left desolate, verse number nine, open your mouth, judge righteously, and minister justice to the poor and needy. Now, what is he saying? There are going to be people in this world who cannot speak for themselves. They don't have a voice. And godly people, righteous people, are supposed to call attention to injustice. Now, you get into a whole other thing about exactly how you do that. And exactly how you do it can sometimes be, you know, you can be constrained by the context. But I will tell you that it is particularly ungodly for people to see others being mistreated and abused and to ignore that and not try to bring attention to that and not try to help. Now, again, exactly how you do that, that can be dependent somewhat on your context. But whether or not God expects us to do that, I don't think that's subject to real debate. Wonderful. Uh, everybody keep your questions coming in. We'd love to have them. Uh, we're, we're getting a good slew of them, but it's time to hear the second section. So uh, Melvin, I'll turn it back to you for, for part two. All right, thank you. All right. Um, do keep sending your questions and we'll, do, we'll take them as best we can. And maybe if we have to deal with some, once we uh, finish these uh, the pre-planned sections here, we can do that. But now I want to spend a little time thinking about why this is so difficult. Okay. Now I just traced out for you in brief, you know, 500 years of history that uh, you're trying to wrestle with. And why is it so difficult to do that? Well, there's probably more reasons than I can um, than rightly articulate, but I'm going to mention a few. I want to mention a few reasons. Okay, one of the difficulties, one of the things that makes this so difficult is ignorance. It is amazing what people don't know about their history, how little people actually know about race relations in America. So they sort of step into a conversation and oftentimes people have really strong feelings, really strong opinions, and they voice their strident views and just honestly, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, schools don't teach on these kinds of things, at least not in a very comprehensive way. And if a person doesn't make it his or her business to try to understand how we got to this place, um, then they're left in ignorance. They're left not knowing, not understanding. And you know what? You can make a real mess when you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I sometimes say, 
the people who least need to talk are the ones who talk the most. I just find that that's true. All right. So ignorance. One of the areas where I think this manifests itself is in the language that we use. Okay, these are very sensitive matters, um, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a bit, but these are very sensitive matters. People are easily offended, and they're easy to offend, okay, because and when you don't know what you're talking about, or you don't know exactly what you're talking about, and you're talking to people about really sensitive things, it's not hard to offend people. Um, and so our vocabulary then, in a sensitive area in particular, is really important. And whenever we start talking about race issues, all anybody wants to say is racist, racist. Well, that is the most extreme term that you can use. And every problem of the heart that deals with race issues is not a question of racism. And a person who's not a racist can still have heart trouble in matters of race. We have to be more careful. We have to be a little bit more informed in the language that we use. I want to just suggest a little paradigm for you here. First, you have sort of stereotypes. Everybody has some kind of stereotypes. Everybody does. Some stereotypes are benign. Some stereotypes are not. But everybody is aware of certain kinds of stereotypes. You form impressions about people based upon things that you probably shouldn't. And you can control for that as long as you acknowledge that you have. Them. Okay, there are prejudices. And this is where you sort of begin to make judgments about people based on usually say immutable characteristics, things they can't change, things they can't control. And prejudices don't have to be evil, right? They don't have to be bad, but they certainly can be. And so we need to be very careful about that. But as you move up this pendulum, you get to biases, which is where you favor certain people or disfavor other people. You can have bigotry, which is where you're intolerant of people who are different, right? They have a different background, they speak a different language. And so you're intolerant of that. And all of this can be a problem before you get to racism. Racism assumes that one person believes that he or she is better than somebody else merely as a consequence of genealogy or heredity, right? This is what Hitler was doing. Now, you don't have to kill six million people to be a racist. Don't, don't get me wrong. But, but this is what he was doing. He thought there was a superior or master race. And of course, we have had that in America, for sure. I mean, the whole system of slavery was built on that. The whole annihilation of the native peoples was built on that. But I don't believe that that is our core issue today. Our core issue today, it's vestiges of that, but I don't believe it is that. And what happens is, if you're having a conversation with somebody and they've got certain biases, maybe they don't even realize it, and you call them a racist, well, listen, they're not a racist, and you immediately put them on the defensive because you're using too extreme a language. And then somebody else who's got bigotry in their heart, they are intolerant of people who are different, uh, their thinking is, hey, I'm not a racist because I don't think I'm better than they are just because I'm this or I'm that, so I don't have a problem, and they're wrong too. Okay, anyway. That's part of it, just our ignorance. We need to get a better handle on the concepts and the spectrum of problems. Now, how this can manifest in the church, this ignorance part. People who believe in Christ cannot pretend that God accepts racial division. We all see it, okay? It's dishonest to behave as if we don't have racial troubles in the church, but people, what they will sometimes do is they will just ignore the fact that these things exist, and sometimes they'll act like God's okay with it. Listen, he's not okay with it. Um, God does not expect people who are supposed to be one in Christ to worship a half a mile apart because some people are black and some people are white. He's absolutely not okay with that. He's made it pretty clear that he expects people to be one. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 in the beginning, he says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. We're all one if we've been baptized into Christ. That's what he expects. Now, he says bond or free, uh, bond or free, uh, Jew or Gentile. We might as well, in our context, say black or white. God doesn't view us as being brothers or sisters of one another because we may look alike. No, 
No, no. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 50 that those who do the will of his father, right? These are his brothers and his sisters. So the racial construct that we have inherited uh, from the world is very different than what we read about in the Bible. And God couldn't be more clear. He created all people, whatever their skin tone, from Adam and Eve. All people descended from Noah right after the flood. Nowhere in the Bible has God ever made an issue about a color of a person's skin. And the Bible tells us very plainly, he is no respecter of persons. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 is one of the places where he says that. Everybody who fears God is accepted with him. And we can't act like we don't know what God's standard is. Okay, we don't get to go through life pretending he's okay with what we have done with race in this country and sometimes in the church. Ignorance, that's one of the problems. Second problem, apathy. Okay, we can't pretend that the church is racially unified, but then we also don't get to act like, mm, it's not a problem that it is. It's okay. Some people don't know. And I, I know that's true because I've had people tell me, hey, I just never knew this or never knew that. Okay. But some people do know and they don't care. Okay. Denial doesn't fix problems. And being willfully blind doesn't fix problems. Toxic racial attitudes and prejudices, they persisted in the church. I mentioned this. They persisted in the church in the first century and they persist now. And we don't get to be apathetic and just say, oh, I don't care. You remember the apostle Peter had uh, some heart trouble when it came to race matters, right? He was a Jew, and you remember in Acts chapter 10, Jesus comes to him and says, I want you to go and speak to these Gentiles, and Peter was very resistant. Jesus had to really work on him to get him to go, and then when he went, he almost sounded like he didn't want to be there. You go back and read Acts chapter 10, he says, uh, Hey, you know, it's not even lawful for me to be here. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, he does go and preach the gospel to them and they become Christians and so forth. And when he goes back home in Acts chapter 11, you read that his own Jewish brethren, Christians, they gave him a hard time at first. This has always been around. Now, what do we do when we see that? Some people say, well, that's just how it is and it's not that big a deal. But see, that's not what Paul did when he saw it. You remember in Galatians chapter 2, the Bible tells us that Peter had come to Antioch, and he's there, and he's spending time with Gentile Christians. And then when some Jewish Christians came, uh, Peter thought, whoa, boy. So he separates himself from these Gentile Christians to be closer to these Jewish Christians. And Paul said he stood condemned. And so he withstood him to the face now, this is an apostle of Jesus Christ, Peter, and you have another apostle of Jesus Christ, Paul, who says, mm -mm, I see that. That's not okay. I'm not going to act like that's not a problem. The church always had these issues and struggles, and people had to deal with it. Well, in America, as I've mentioned in brief, we've always had these issues. And what we can do sometimes is we say, well, if it's quiet, then it's okay. And friend, that's just not true. Um, cancer is quiet. And by the time it announces itself, it's oftentimes too late. Or the action that's required to address it is pretty dramatic. Um, we should not do that in the church. We do need to care. We need to open our eyes and educate ourselves. And then we need to care because it's contrary to the word of God. Uh, there's a lot of examples I could give you, but for the sake of time, maybe I won't. But things have improved. That's obvious. Okay, I told you, 1619, 1776, 1787, okay, 1865. We come all the way up to Reconstruction. Um, the, 18, the 1960s, people being assassinated and so forth, things have certainly improved. But we know they're not what they should be. We still have some ways to go. So we can acknowledge the good that has been done. We can acknowledge the progress that has been made. And at the same time, we can say, we're not going to be satisfied with things not being the way they should be. The society has its problems, and we may never fix the problems in society. But you know what? Among believers, 
we're not okay with having a black church and a white church. We're not okay with that. We're not okay with Sunday morning being the most segregated hour in the whole country. We're not okay with that. And um, we shouldn't be apathetic like it doesn't matter. Okay, third thing I'll mention, why is this so difficult? I'll mention this idea of guilt. Now, why do I mention this? Even if people didn't personally participate in certain atrocities of the past, there is still an element of shame and guilt when these matters are discussed. I know this is my personal experience in talking with people. You know, we'll have conversation and sometimes people will acknowledge to me they're uncomfortable even thinking about or talking about these things because they feel guilty or ashamed. Can I say that that would make it difficult for them to have, have a conversation? Let me say something. If you didn't do something, you don't need to be ashamed. If you didn't do something, you don't need to feel guilty about what other people did. And if you're talking to someone, you can't blame other people for things they didn't do. Come on now. At the same time, though, if you see things that should be done, if you see things now I'm talking about that should be redressed and you don't, well, maybe it's okay to feel guilty about that. We shouldn't behave as if we have no responsibility to pursue true unity and justice for people. We shouldn't act like we don't have an obligation to do that. I'm not talking about what happened 100 years ago. Nope. I'm not talking about what happened 50 years ago. Many of us weren't even around just yet. I was coming, but I wasn't here yet 50 years ago. I'm saying right now today, if you can look and see things that are happening that shouldn't be, if you can see in the church that the church is not being what Christ wants it to be, accept the responsibility for helping to promote unity and if you're not willing to do that, then I humbly submit maybe you do need to be a bit guilty about that. We don't get to ignore the problem. Listen, in Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says in verse number 3 that we should endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavor to keep it. Work to keep it. Bigotry not racism, we haven't even gotten to racism. Bigotry undermines the commission that Jesus gave his disciples. What did Jesus tell his disciples to do? You go to every creature in every nation. We don't get to skip over souls because the souls don't look like us or skip over souls because the souls didn't come from the same part of town that we came from. Every creature in every nation and bigotry and race troubles, heart troubles dealing with matters of race, they hinder us from doing that. When we imitate the world and the worst legacies of our fathers, because let's just be honest now, if we go back in time, we all have some ancestors, some people who came before us who did some things that we're not proud of. Well, we're not responsible for what they did, but if we imitate what they have done, that compromises our influence as light and salt. Jesus says that we should be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And guess what? As believers, the world sees whether we are living like the world or whether we are being salt and light. And if we're not being salt and light, then we have a reason to be guilty. We have a reason to feel ashamed, but not because of what somebody else did, but because of what we have done or have not done. Um, this hinders and the, the idea of racial division, it hinders and compromises our communion with the Lord. You remember in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about this and he says, when you come together in the church, I hear that there are divisions among you and I partly believe it. And then he goes on and explains to them how ungodly all that is. And what I'm saying to you is when we look at the church, just the racial makeup of the church, don't we see division? I can't do anything about what some guys did 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but I can do something about right now. And so I'm just saying guilt can make you not want to go down the road, have a conversation or do what you can. Don't feel guilty about other people, accept responsibility about what you can and should be doing today. All right. Another thing I'll mention in this respect, things that can make it difficult. Why are these conversations so difficult? Anger. 
it's kind of difficult to have a conversation with somebody who is angry, who is upset. Um, let me say just honestly, I get angry. I get upset about some of the things that I see, some of the things that I hear, uh, some of the things that I see in here, they resonate with me on a kind of personal level because I've experienced things, I've seen things, right? Or I have concerns about members of my own family. And so I can get upset, but um, you know, I can't get upset with somebody who didn't have anything to do with it or isn't trying to defend something that was wrong, no. But it is natural to be upset about injustices, especially when they impact you directly or indirectly. I spent some time, um, not a whole lot of time, but I went to speak and uh, did a meeting on a Native American reservation. Listen, the things, um, the decimation of the Native peoples on this continent, well, I guess you could say that happened a long time ago, but those people are still experiencing the effects of that today. And uh, anybody think that they don't have a right to be upset about it? Um, the Jews, you know, when they, they were, uh, for the most part, uh, Hitler was trying to exterminate the Jews. And uh, that happened, I mean, you could say, well, that happened a long time ago. But anybody think that they may not still have some residue because of that? Maybe be a little, been out of shape and sensitive about that? I mean, it's not like it's abnormal for people to be, um, have some, some level of anger about atrocities and things like that. And so it's not helpful if folks say things like, get over it, right? Well, you know, maybe, maybe you don't fully appreciate what you're asking somebody to get over. Maybe you don't fully appreciate what the ramifications of whatever has happened and the scar tissue that that's left for people. You wouldn't say to somebody who had uh, sort of endured some kind of tragedy, or even if it was somebody they loved who had endured some kind of tragedy just to get over it. Now that's one side of it. The other side of it though is you can't make progress if you perpetually operate and move and deal with people with a sense of anger. Specifically, if they're not the people who have done things or who are not trying to promote or support things that are uh, doing injury to you. Okay, anger. Now, my time is getting short. I'm gonna mention a couple of things real quick and then we'll take a break. But things that make it difficult. Why is this so hard? Now, I said in passing the sensitivity thing, we just live in a culture where people don't seem to get that everybody doesn't have to think like we do. It just, I don't know why. People can't digest the idea that honest, sincere people are entitled to their own personal convictions and the fact that they didn't come to the same conclusion you came to is not a reason for you to be offended or upset. Uh, but at the same time, we do have to respect the fact that we should be careful in how we communicate with people about sensitive things. It's a two-way thing, right? You shouldn't, you don't wanna be easily offended. You wanna try not to be easily offended but at the same time, you don't get to sort of throw out the idea that you're responsible for your words and the impact they have on other people. And the last thing I'll mention is uh, we just don't have a very good culture for listening. Okay, so many people are interested in winning arguments, more interested in that than they are in understanding. And uh, this absolute intolerance that we have for people with different understandings, when you start talking about these kinds of issues in society or in the church, it makes it kind of hard to have a constructive conversation when nobody's listening. All right. So I'm going to pause right there and uh, just laid out a few things. There's a lot more that could be said, but I'm interested to see what questions we have. All right. We've actually had a lot of questions come in here. Uh, in the meantime, please continue to submit them. Uh, for everybody that's watching, that'd be wonderful. Um, and a lot of the questions uh, are are about, uh, well, uh, religion and about politics. So isn't that interesting? Um, but uh, let's, let's focus on the questions here. We're seeing a lot of them about the church and the divisions in churches. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a, a message here from Micaiah that says, what concrete steps do we take to desegregate churches? 
many do not seem willing to cross this divide. All right. Well, okay, listen, if people aren't willing, it's going to be hard to do. Um, but let's start with folks who are at least interested in trying to bridge these gaps. Now, I'm going to say a little bit more about this uh, in the next section as we get ready to close out. But, but here's what I tell you. You have to be intentional about it. Um, it's not going to be accidental, right? If there's been one church a half mile away and another church a half mile away for 50 years, guess what? They're not all of a sudden going to be in the same building. People have to make, take the initiative and make the effort to get to know one another. And it's just too easy not to do it. We live in the same neighborhoods. We go to the same schools. We work at the same places. We work out of the same gyms and we worship at different churches. What's going on there? What's going on there? Nobody's made us do it. That's what's going on. Because in all these other areas, the government's just said, hey, look, got to do it. And it's done. Well, in the church, Christians have to want to do it, and you have to work at it. And uh, it's not always going to be easy, right? And, you know, you're going to make some mistakes. But sincere-minded people, I'm just talking about individuals, sincere-minded individuals can make a difference. Do you go to a church where everybody looks like you? Okay. You ever tried visiting a church where everybody didn't? Okay. Uh, you ever invited some folks who don't look like you to come and worship with you? It's a crazy dynamic. Okay. We live around all these people. We go to school with all these people. We work with all these people and all of us, but somehow, I mean, people who are different than us, but somehow or another, when we get to the church building, everybody looks like us. How does that work? See, we're not following the Great Commission. That's what I'm saying to you. Every creature in every place, and we're picking and choosing. We're not broadcasting the seed, but we're looking for the right kind of person. Oh, he looks like me, or I'm comfortable with him. That's not the standard. Broadcast the message to everyone. You cast the gospel net, and Jesus said you will draw in of all kinds. We're not doing that. That's the biggest problem we have. We're not doing that. I think I'll save some of the other questions on the church integration uh, for, for later on after I want to hear what, what your third part is about. Uh, addressing some of the political uh, questions, and I know this is always a tough thing because people have opinions, yeah. uh, but it is still um, important here. I wanted to find the exact one here. Um, here's a message from Melvin, a different Melvin uh, okay. than you, unless you're typing fast. No, I didn't plan any questions. Yeah. <laughs> this is another Melvin, but another Melvin says, politics as a whole has seemed to blemish the very unity of the body of Christ as of late. It seems as though there are many that are picking sides on different issues. And I'd like to add in here that we were having specifically talking about party discussions uh, with, the, with the presidential debate on supporting white supremacy. Um, we also have Black Lives Matter um, as organizations here. It says, uh, but both sides, uh, and not talking about racially, but talking about Democrat and Republican here, seem to have conflicting issues when compared to Christ. Should the church, as a broad sense here, back away from politics since it has caused division? Uh, I figure, especially with your law background, that might be a good question. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a short answer and tell you, uh, yes, I think the church is far too intertwined in politics and has been for a long time. What people have done is they have reduced their allegiance to Christ to a vote. Instead of Christians living radically Christian lives and going into the world and being the hands and feet of Jesus, we are trying to delegate our responsibilities to other people by casting a vote for one or the other. And it is absolutely unconscionable. And my thinking is, if we can't handle the vote, then we don't need to use it. Now, I believe in voting, okay? I don't believe I have to vote for any particular heathen, though. I don't believe I have to vote for this party or that party. I believe that when I go in and I vote, I am voting representing Jesus, and I don't have to make a deal with the devil to do that. And that devil can have on a red tie or a blue tie. But I definitely think that we are way too involved in politics. We have gotten to a place as believers where we think that we have done our Christian duty by asking someone else to do our Christian duty. It is a tremendous mistake. We've been making it for a long time and it's absolutely getting worse. 
So that is my short answer to that. I'm gonna go with yes. We would do far better if we just depended on the Bible and the body of Christ carrying out the dictates of Christ and we just stop worrying about these politicians because we can pick whichever flavor of heathen you want. They're, they're just, they're all ungodly people. I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anybody, but that's just the truth. They're all ungodly people. They do not represent Jesus. And so they may be closer aligned, not right aligned, not right, but closer aligned to the scriptures on one issue and just absolutely against the Bible on a bunch of others. That's not something that I feel real comfortable throwing my wholehearted endorsement behind. Jesus wasn't a Pharisee and he wasn't a Sadducee. Why not? Because they were both wrong. Brother, I appreciate it. <laughs> I, didn't, I hope I didn't get too fired up there, but I, I feel pretty strongly about that one. I mean, no, we, we I do too. And it, it, I tell you, I know it's always bad with politics in general that, that you try to find people that, that say things that you agree with and you're like, yeah, that's right. But I'm listening to you here and I'm like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I know uh, people feel very strongly about their politics. I feel very strongly about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we could, if people, if Christians would spend half as much energy sharing Jesus' message as they do their favorite politicians, we would be in a very different place right now. Mm-hmm. I, I like it. And, and, and ultimately, we read in the Bible, that's how the world changed. It was through through Christ, not through uh, a political movement. Uh, and, and the same way, not saying that it's it's wrong for us to do it, but it's Jesus needs to be the focus. Oh, that's right. um, voting is a liberty. It's not an obligation, right? For It's not a Christian obligation. It's a liberty. And what do you do if you can't handle a certain liberty? Or if in a certain context, the liberty, exercising the liberty would cause problems spiritually. What do you do? Paul said, I won't eat meat. I won't eat meat forever. It's just, something I, don't, I don't have to do it, okay? And if it's gonna cause problems, then I won't. And I'm not saying voting by itself causes problems, but the, the activism part of it, the arguing and all that, it's obviously causing problems. I think the question was, do we need to back away from it somewhat? And again, I think the answer is yes. So. So let me let me do a, a slight follow up to that here, and and I know I know time wise, I'm sorry, sorry. but uh, specifically something like Black Lives Matter is a political organization. Of course, there's the the use of it as a as a phrase, as a description, as a, a statement, and then there's also the organization. Um, considering you're addressing uh, our affiliation with the red tie or the blue tie, as you say, uh, what about our affiliation with um, Black Lives Matter as an organization and as an idea. Yeah, so as an organization, it's an ungodly organization, right? I mean, anybody anybody can pull up the organization on the web and you see their platform and it's an ungodly platform. And so I would never align myself with a group like that. I'd caution any Christian against doing that. Um, the concept itself, though, uh, I find absolutely no problem with. You know, the, the concept and the slogan pre-existed this organization that sort of co-opted it and did some things to it. And I don't think most, I mean, if people are honest, okay, if one person says, okay, Black Lives Matter, not, not the group, I, and you just got to be honest. Most people who are saying that phrase, nothing to do with the organization, just never even given that a second thought. And so sometimes we try to put that on people, and that's just not true, and I think most of us know that. But then the same people would say, well, Blue Lives Matter. Okay, well, wait a minute. Is that sinful? Is that wrong? Come on, it's not wrong. If I said to you, unborn lives matter, is that going to offend anybody? If not, why not? Because it's true. Okay, if you say all lives matter, does that offend anybody? Does that bother anybody? No, it's true. So the concept, the idea, any group of people, and this goes back to the question that our college student had asked, any group of people that you see being mistreated or abused or marginalized, when you speak up on their behalf and you try to call attention to that, come on, that, that can't be, you can't treat that as if that is the problem that you're trying to call attention to some kind of injustice. But again, now that organization, that's a whole different thing. Uh, we, don't need, we don't need organizations as Christians. We don't need these things. We just need to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We have an organization, it's called the church. And so we should be able to do the things that Christ requires of us, 
through that organization. And if we do that way, we leave all the baggage that comes with all these other things, Democrats, Republicans, Black Lives Matter, any of these Antifa people and all, we leave all that stuff aside and we just be the church, then we'd be much better off. Wonderful. I, I just have one other thing here. It's not even a question, but uh, Bill writes here, he says, be careful, Brother Ote. Pretty soon people will be pressuring you to run for office. <laughs> I'd never make it. I'd never make it. I have too many sermons online. Once they start pulling those sermons down, I'd, I'd never make it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll save the rest of these questions. Uh, well, so we're not going to be able to go through all of them, but we'll save some more questions for after this uh, last section. So please. All right. All right. Well, I want to say thank you uh, to those who have tuned in and participated. I hope it's helpful. Um, you know, we've, we've looked in brief how we got here, uh, make a couple of observations about why this is so difficult. I want to leave you with some thoughts about how we can go forward, okay? We need to first have our minds wrapped around what we're trying to accomplish. We can't fix America. We can't save America, but we can work on ourselves. Uh, we can influence our neighbors for Christ. We can help the church. And uh, so I want to make some observations or some, some suggestions of things that we can do to promote racial unity um, in the church, in our own neighborhoods. And I think if we can do that, then that'll affect the nation as a whole. First thing I'll say, we have to be intentional about living more radically Christian lives, okay? This kind of touches on a question that was just asked, but I think the biggest issue that we have is that Christians are not totally committed to kingdom living. This is the problem. The problem is so many people who claim to know Christ are marginal in their faith. It's something they take off and put on. Bigotry, uh, prejudices, racism, these are surface level problems. They're surface level problems. The problem is a heart problem and it doesn't begin with that. The biggest issue we have is that we are not as committed to Christ and Christian living as we should be. That's the biggest problem. We need to live more radically Christian lives. Now, too many times what we do is we expect our faith to conform to our patriotism and to our political preferences and to our cultural pride. And we just expect our faith in Christ to kind of have to fit into all of that. And then we come out with this sort of amalgamation, this monstrosity that we want to call the Christian faith. No, 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 that's something else. Philippians chapter three and verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven from whence also we wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now we live in America, and as far as it goes, this is about as good a place as any, but this is not our citizenship. Our loyalty is not to this patch of dirt, it's to Christ and to heaven. So we need to realize that our personal view is not the Christian view just because we happen to be Christians. That's not all we are. We're members of a national group, a racial group, an ethnic group, a social group, an age group, an economic group, right? An educational group. And these allegiances or these alliances, they have a profound impact on our perspective. So what we need to do is try to elevate ourselves out of all of that and just have a Christian perspective. We have to take the time to work through all of that. And as we do, we will draw closer to God and we'll draw closer to other believers even if those other believers don't look like us, don't speak the same language, don't have the same social backgrounds, we will still draw closer to them. And it will mean that in some cases, we will distance ourselves from other people who do look like us, who do come from the same places we come from, who do have our same cultural backgrounds, because they do not have a commitment to radical Christian living. So that's the first thing. We need to be intentional about living radically Christian lives. The second thing I'll mention is we need to be intentional about knowing others better. Now, I say this specifically to people in the church, but it applies to people outside the church. But I say this specifically to people in the church. So many problems can be resolved or become easier to resolve if we just know each other better. You know, it's hard to work through something or to solve a problem with somebody you have no relationship with. 
but we could go a long way if we just work at having relationships with people that we may have to be intentional about forming, okay? Now, just kinds of things you've probably seen before. You could have, you know, area-wide services. Uh, some areas do that where they'll have congregations in the same area have uh, joint singings or uh, pulpit exchanges or different things like that. What I'm saying is let's have some actual fellowship, though. <laughs> I'm not talking about just sharing a meal. Now, sharing a meal is fine, but sharing a meal is not the New Testament idea of fellowship. Fellowship is partnership and working together. Let's do that. Let's have a campaign where congregations in a certain area actually come together and work together to evangelize the community or to reach out to widows and orphans in the community. Let's work at having diverse speakers, diverse teachers, diverse leaders, uh, fostering feelings of being included. Let's stop having duplicate uh, gospel meetings and lectureships and camps. Let's work on being inclusive. We could get a long way if we were just intentional about knowing each other better, okay? Third thing I'll mention, let's be intentional about trying to understand other people. There is no virtue in having strong and strident opinions and sharing them indiscriminately about people and circumstances that we don't fully understand. Now, I see that. I know that Facebook is the thing, or my, my kids tell me this is for old people now, but I guess for me, it's still what my friends use. But whatever social media platform people use, um, it's just, we just make a big mess of it. People get on there and just say all kinds of crazy things and they have the strongest opinions and they just don't even know who they're talking about or what they're talking about. Ignorance regarding the deep and abiding nature of the problems we have in this country or in the church. Listen, this is not a virtue. God expects us to learn about what's going on around us to learn about other people so that we can be effective in trying to help them. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 24. Uh, there's a couple of passages I just want to mention in this regard. Proverbs 24, verse number 11, uh, the Bible says, deliver them that are carried away to death and those that are ready to be slain, see that you hold back. Now, what's he saying? When you see people who are being mistreated, abused, killed in this context, you need to try to save them, to rescue them. And listen to verse 12. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he that weighs the hearts consider it? And he that keeps your soul, does he not know it? And shall he not render to every man according to his word? What's he saying? You know, sometimes people say, well, I just didn't know. Well, sometimes it's true that people don't know. Uh, but sometimes the truth is people just don't want to know. They turn a blind eye and God is going to hold us responsible for that. Ignorance is not okay. We have to try to understand. Now in our society, there's nobody who doesn't know that there's some real things going on. Now you may not understand everything that is going on, but this is then your responsibility to try to understand what is going on. There are real challenges and you have the intellect and the capacity to be intentional about trying to understand what is going on and to alleviate suffering for other people. We have a responsibility to do that. Paul is uh, obviously one of the greatest folks you'll ever learn anything about in the New Testament. The Bible tells us a great deal about his ministry. I wanna ask you to, to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. It's one of my favorites. Paul was a Jew, uh, born and raised as a Jew, very devout Jew, and uh, he spent most of his lifetime ministering as a Christian, spent most of his lifetime ministering to Gentiles. And I told you, there was historical problems between Jews and Gentiles. Now, he was very effective working with people who had a very different background than he had question, how did he do it? Why was he successful? First Corinthians chapter nine, Listen to this, verse 19, his attitude. For though I was free from all men, I brought myself under bondage to all that I might gain the more. 
And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, not being myself under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Now, what is he saying? Well, when I'm dealing with Jews, I understood their background as Jews and their sensitivity to the law. And so I respected that in dealing with them so that I could be effective in dealing with them. Now, I didn't act like I was under the law, but I respected their background so that I could be effective in dealing with them. Now, then he says, uh, to verse 21, to them that are without law, he's talking about Gentiles, as without law, not being without law to God, but under law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. What's he saying? When I'm dealing with Gentiles, and they don't know anything about the law of Moses, I don't go and push the law of Moses on them. I deal with them understanding their background. <clears throat> he says in verse 20, to the weak I became weak, that I might gain the weak. I became, I am become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And I do all things for the gospel's sake that I may be a joint partaker thereof. That's what I'm saying. Paul understood the different peoples that he was dealing with. He made it his business to understand their backgrounds so he could share the gospel with them, whether they were Jew or Gentile, whether they were black or white. That's what we need to do. We need to be intentional about trying to understand other people so we can be effective. Um, Maybe this is for time's sake, maybe this is the last one I'll mention, and then we'll take some questions. But we need to be intentional about preaching and teaching on bias, bigotry, racism, stereotypes, prejudices. The church avoids oftentimes directly confronting things like this. We avoid it like the plague, okay? We'll preach on every other sin, but we rarely deal directly with this sin. It's only been a problem in America for about 500 years, okay? So one of these days, we ought to go ahead and get around to just dealing with it. And I'm not suggesting that we should ride it as a hobby horse and every sermon that we preach ought to be about it, but this is a real issue. And it's not just an issue out there. It's an issue in the hearts of some people sitting in the pews of our church buildings. We need to preach on it. Um, we shouldn't continue just a policy of avoidance. Now, what's the deal? Bigotry and racism are sinful. Yes, they are. They, if nothing else, they constitute being a respecters of persons, and the Bible tells us not to be respecters of persons, right? Leviticus 19, 15, Deuteronomy 1, 17, Proverbs 24, 23, James 2, chapter, one, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 and 9. We're not supposed to be respecters of persons. God is not, and neither should we be. Anybody who does what God wants is, is acceptable with him, and anybody who's doing what God wants ought to be acceptable with us. If we don't preach on it, there will be people, some of them very close to us, who will die and have to go to judgment with these problems in their hearts, and we should do something to try to help them. Sometimes we want to deal with these matters at like 10,000 feet, you know, and we just speak in such generalities that nobody thinks we're actually talking to them. At some point, we actually have to get down and challenge people where they are. We need to preach on it. Okay, leaders and uh, members need to be encouraged to see race the way God sees it. It's a non-issue. God doesn't love one person more or less because of the color of their skin. He made us all, and he made us different. I sometimes tell people the color of our skin with God means about as much as the color of our eyes. He doesn't care, and we shouldn't care. We need to preach that, we need to teach that, and we need to encourage that. We need to have these discussions responsibly, but we need to have them. And just touching on uh, something that was just asked before, one of my recommendations is when you start talking about these things, keep politics out of it because it has nothing to do with what the Bible says on these topics. All right, Christians have a duty uh, to speak up, and I made mention of that earlier. Um, we have a duty to tell people what the Bible says, people in the world and people in the church. Now, sometimes we don't feel comfortable doing that, and I get it. But as we grow in our own understanding, right, then we should be engaging people um, who have the same kind of limited understanding that we used to have. 
because sometimes we're the only people who can reach those folks. Um, it's important for us to help people around us understand the harm that prejudice and bigotry and bias and racism, the harm that these things do to individual lives and to the church. And we should try to help them elevate their thinking. Uh, and as I said, in some cases, we will be the only people who can do it. We just need to be a bit bolder. Okay, we need to educate ourselves. And then we need to be a bit bolder in trying to educate other people. So I just try to mention here in brief a few things. Be intentional about living a more radically Christian life. Be intentional about knowing others better, especially other Christians who may not look like us. Be, in, be intentional about trying to understand other people, their perspectives better, and be intentional about preaching on bias and bigotry and racism. These are just a few things I think that we can do uh, to help improve the situation. And so I'm happy to take uh, any questions you have. All right, <clears throat> we've still got some questions on here. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, Ron, and I'm gonna give a big shout out to Ron Spangler here. He's uh, one of the elders at the Fist and and Kenny Church of Christ. And he uh, just stepped into the role of, of uh, working with the college ministry here. So uh, he has done a fantastic job getting all this stuff organized. Uh, and so he's, he's taking care of the tech back here. Uh, just as a quick announcement, first of all, uh, if you like here in Melbourne, and I'm sure you do, uh, he's going to be coming to visit uh, Columbus, Ohio. So all of us uh, local folks can look forward to, to hearing him. He's going to be here in July of 2021, and we are we are optimistic that COVID will be all gone by that time. Uh, but uh, this will be for a family week for adults, teens, uh, and there will be a children's VBS. So that's obviously something very much to look forward to. And uh, before I mention the book, I, I will ask uh, a question here from Kelly, where Kelly says, are there any specific resources that you recommend to learn about America's history of racism or the church's history of racism? And I might add how the church can deal with racism. Do you know of any books at all that might be uh, dealing with such a thing? So there are books. Um, I didn't come with a ready list, but um, maybe if somebody were to ask me, you know, shoot me a message on Facebook or something like that, I could recommend, um, I could recommend some books. Now, listen, there's some books that I think are sort of older books that have been around for a long time. And then there's some newer ones that I haven't even read that I see people talking about. Um, and none of them will be perfect, right? But what you're trying to do is get a more well-rounded understanding of what's going on. There are some classic books that if you have an interest in these things that I think you should read. And then there's some newer ones that uh, maybe I still need to read, but uh, they've been highly recommended. So I could, I could give somebody, you know, a short reading list if they shot me a message to ask me for it. And I set you up, by the way, for uh, talking about this wonderful book that you co-authored, which I have read, and I believe that it is fantastic. Now, obviously, it's not uh, getting into the history as much, uh, but uh, would you like to say a few words on your book about what it's about? Yeah, so th this book is the product of four preachers, two black guys, two white guys who tried to hash out a lot of these issues. And so we spent the better part of a year just talking about what are some of the issues, the questions that people are asking, and what are some biblical answers, and then just some wise guidance we might give to people who are trying to work through uh, these kinds of race issues. So you know, listen, the four of us, we all have different life experiences. We all have different, uh, you know, in some cases we have different ideas, but we got the same Bible. We have the same Lord. And so we spent a year trying to work through these things. And so in this book, we speak with one voice on its 37 scriptural answers to 37 questions people are asking about racial tension in the church. So in this book, we speak with one voice in trying to answer these questions. I personally think the book is unique. Um, I think it's special because of that. I think because you got four people who sit down together and hash through these things, don't see everything exactly the same way, but don't have to see everything exactly the same way to come to an understanding about what God expects us to do uh, in sort of so that we can maintain unity. 
And that's the thing I think that makes the, the book special. I sometimes say if I wrote the book, I could have sat down and I could have just sat down and wrote the book myself. It'd be a very different book. Okay, somebody else could have sat down and wrote the book. It'd be a very different book. But I think you have a balanced, considered approach where in each question we're trying to, okay, you know, black folks are going to, you know, read this this way and white folks are going to read this this way. And, okay, well, what about this? And so we just, we tried our best to be balanced. And so I think it's helpful because of that. I think it's, it's a unique resource because of that. Uh, I can speak personally just saying that it, I I could recognize that there were some clearly some issues and, and mostly over terms. Um, you know, you get into specific vocabulary of, you know, what, what form of racism are we talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, things like microaggressions and things like that. And it seemed to be with the specific ministers that were involved with this, there might be a disagreement on the actual uh, terms, but there was an agreement that if this happens, this is wrong. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Well, part of what goes on there is, you know, with vocabulary, people launch headlong into these discussions and they, they don't stop to define what they're actually talking about. Mm -hmm. So they're arguing and they're not even maybe talking about the same things at some points. And so that's part of what we did like early on. Okay, wait a minute. If we're, we're going to use this term in the book, Okay, we need to define what we mean when we say this. Okay, you use it that way. I use it this way. Somebody's going to read the book and they're trying to use it another way. Mm -mm. We need to define our terms and that takes time. And most people just are in such a hurry that they don't have the time to do that. But you can't have a productive conversation when you're just throwing words around and people aren't saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, you know, we have sort of a, um, a glossary in there where we define the terms that we're using to help people know when you read this in this book, this is what we mean. Okay. It's not what you heard on the radio. It's not what your friends are saying. This is what we mean when we use it. All right. Uh, thank you. And we've got another question here. How many questions, more questions are you willing to take with, with the time? Well, let's just take some, maybe we'll see if I can, I'll try to be a little more direct uh, and maybe that'll help us get through a few. I, I, I try to be comprehensive, but maybe I'll try to be a little more uh, focused and, and get through a few. Sure thing. We've got one of our students, Joan, is going to read this next one. All right. <laughs> So Kennedy from Tide for Christ asks, uh, it seems that specifically in the South, social groups continue to gather based on race and rarely make conscious strides to socially desegregate. How can the church, specifically college students, reach out to communities of color to form a more inclusive worship environment? Okay, so there's a couple things there. One is, yeah, we still have, I don't know what it looks like everywhere else, but we still have a, a pretty obvious degree of segregation. I'm in Montgomery, Alabama. It's pretty pretty obvious. Um, and, but now college students in particular, I think college students are better situated to overcome some of these things than some older folks because they just don't have some of the same baggage that some older folks do. And so my suggestion would be, young people, you make sure you are intentional about reaching out to people who may have a different background than you do on the college campus inviting those people to come to the, uh, the congregations where you worship. And at the same time, I think you can bring these concerns to the attention of the leaders in the congregations where you are, right? Hey, this is somebody we would like to have come and speak to our college group. This is someone we would like to have come and speak to the congregation. Hey, there's a congregation where we have friends who worship down the road or on the other part of town, we would like to have some things together with them. And uh, it's a little maybe difficult for younger people in particular because it feels like you're trying to lead from the back, uh, but you can certainly lead by your own example and you can influence and encourage people um, by pulling their coattails a little bit. That's what the old timers called it, by pulling their coattails a little bit and letting them know that mm, you can do better here and here are some suggestions as to how you can. All right. Uh, we have a question here from Bridget, and this is uh, was asked earlier back whenever we were talking about uh, integrating congregations uh, together. And uh, 
she asks, understanding that racism exists, how do you not become paranoid that racism is happening if a slate occurs in the church or in everyday life? All right. So as I mentioned, racism is the most extreme. We don't go to the most extreme until we really need to go there. Okay. So a person can say something or do something that's insensitive just because they're ignorant. They don't know how certain things are going to be perceived. And I've had that happen actually recently where somebody said something and I was not bothered at all, but somebody else was highly offended because there's a certain context in which what they said could have been perceived a certain way. They had no clue. Okay, so you got to give people the benefit of the doubt. Okay, if you see things like that, you try to educate people, bring things to their attention. It could also be the case that, hey, people, you know, sometimes grow up with a certain kind of, uh, in a certain kind of household or in a certain environment. So they bring certain prejudices or certain biases with them. When they're baptized, that stuff doesn't go away. Okay, that's, that comes with them into the church. So you're going to see it. And the thing is, when you do see it, you have to go to the person, go to the person in love, go to the person as understanding as you possibly can be. This may not be your weakness, see, but you do have weaknesses. That's what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, to the weak, I became weak. Well, he may not have the same weakness, but he would try to bring these things to people's attention, bring these things to their attention with the Bible, let the word of God do the work. Um, and let me just tell you, you're not going to go through life um, in America and not encounter racial issues. You just not. Okay. Now, if you're in America, you can't expect that you're going to go through life in American churches and never encounter racial issues. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, you, you, people in the church are this or that. Yeah. Cause people are that. Okay, but the people in the church are at least in the right place to try to help get better. And uh, so I would just tell you, hey, listen, just please don't be overly discouraged. Now, there are some situations, I've seen situations where you got people in high positions of leadership in churches who are, they're, they're way down the line of heart trouble and race problems. But that's not everybody. And uh, I wouldn't want to do anything drastic leave or something like that unless it was really necessary. Otherwise, if I see it, that's an opportunity for me to try to help the person. They may not see it and other people around them may not see it. I like it. All right. Uh, we have a question here from Charlotte. And uh, I, I like this question myself uh, just because I know with my own conversation, I've got a, uh, a cousin that has uh, recently gotten into um, uh, liberal theology and specifically has gotten into uh, reading about black theology and he's reading several books on that. Uh, and so a, a, a very good question and apropos here is, is Christ being represented as a white man also part of the history of America? Do you believe this should continue to be accepted in the church of Christ? Okay, visual depictions of Christ, in my, in my opinion, are not the best idea to start with. We don't know exactly what Christ looked like. We don't really have a really strong idea, even from scriptures, of what he looked like. But listen, depicting Jesus as a European male is obviously a European phenomenon, okay? Uh, this existed before America was a country, and we just brought that with us, right? When Europeans began to depict the savior of the world, surprise, and guess what? He looked just like them, except Jesus was not a European. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that, okay? So he, he was a Middle Eastern male, and he looked like Middle Eastern males. He looked like probably some of the folks that we would uh, flag and be afraid of today because they were Middle Eastern, okay? That's, that's probably what he looked like. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, I won't say it's an American phenomenon, it's certainly a European phenomenon, and Americans brought that over, uh, European cousins and so forth. And I, I, I'm actually, you know, uh, kind of sensitive to that because I think it's teaching false doctrine. I mean, you can teach false doctrine in different ways. And so when I see uh, churches depicting Bible people uh, in ways that we know are inaccurate, I bring that to people's attention. Say, oh, come on, man. I mean, you might as well stand. If you stood up and said Jesus was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, I mean, that, you, you call that teaching false doctrine, wouldn't you? 
Well, if you just give people a picture of it and you don't say a word, well, that's the same thing. And so I, I know I've seen pictures and I, I understand, um, it, it, depending on the, the, the congregation, um, there have been some black congregations that have adopted uh, images of a black, a black Christ. And you would say the same thing about that, that it's just not accurate. Yeah, we don't know what he looked like. And this is the problem. This is the problem. You know what? God knew what he was doing. If he wanted us to know what Jesus looked like physically, he would have told us. Okay. And for us, you go to Isaiah 53, right? He tells us that he had no form or comeliness that we would desire him. Okay. But what do we do when we depict him? We make them look exactly like what we would desire. <laughs> uh, just cut it out. Just cut it out. We don't need to know what he looks like. Uh, it doesn't matter what he looked like. Uh, so I'd say the same thing to anybody. Uh, I, just, I just don't think it's a great idea to try to do these fine um, visual depictions of Christ. You know, I've seen you know, people have like a, you know, sort of a, uh, a, a telescopic view of, of Jesus hanging on the cross or something like that. I mean, that's, I think that's a little different, right? Than just trying to, you know, put his features and all that. That's just crazy. You don't know what he looked like and whatever, however you do it is wrong and it's not necessary. So I'd say the same thing to, to anybody. All right. I uh, have a question here uh, from Delita uh, that uh, it's a statement, but I think I can rephrase it as a question here at the end, uh, but makes the, the, the very accurate point. Most communities are still overwhelmingly segregated. Such provides barriers that even Christians seem unwilling to cross or develop relationships. Uh, I guess the, the question in that is, is how do we, uh, how do we all, become more willing to cross those boundaries uh, in religious and in personal life? Well, we have to be intentional. I think it just goes to the same things that I mentioned before, you know, living a radically Christian life. I'm not, you know, I'm not an American first. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat first. I'm not a black guy first. I'm not, you know, a native of this town or that town. I'm a Christian first. Okay. That has to constrain the way I deal with people the way I think about people, the way I interact with people, the way I speak to people. Um, and I need to be intentional about trying to build relationships with people. Again, I go back to it. Jesus said, every creature in every nation. Okay, so if the people who live next door to you happen to look like you, okay, fine. If the people who live the next block down don't happen to look like you, you're going to ignore them. Okay, the people, you know, that you're you know, going to school with and work with and all that. If we will just do what Jesus said, it really isn't any more complicated than that. Every creature in every nation, you know what will wind up happening? Our country will be a lot more integrated than it is. And I'm not all that, obviously, I'm, I, honestly, I'm not interested in saving America. That's not my, I, that's not why I wake up every day. It's the church and if we can do what we're supposed to do in the church, that will affect our country for the better. It's not going to work the other way. Okay. The, the, the country is not going to save the church. That's not going to happen. We can influence the country though, by being the church that Jesus calls us to be. And uh, just being who we're supposed to be, I think will solve a lot of that. will help a lot of that. You willing to take one last question here? Yep. All right. One last question here. And this is from Isaac. And Isaac says, how do we steer conversations about race issues away from politics and towards matters of faith and the heart? Yeah, so this is a struggle uh, because I find that Christians have a difficulty with this. Every day, I find that Christians have a difficulty with it. And for some reason, it becomes more acute every four years or so. It just becomes more difficult for Christians to separate these two things. Um, but now just for me, the way I happen to do it, is I just tell people, honestly, I'm not really interested in your political views. I'm just not. I don't care what you think about politics. I don't, I don't care what you think about politics, and I'm not going to tell you what I think about politics, okay? So if we're going to have a discussion and you start going down that line, I'm out because I don't care. Um, and I try not to be quite that blunt, okay? But if they don't get it, then I wind up saying, it. because listen, I'm interested in what you think about Jesus. That's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in what you think 
about one guy or gal who's going to be in this position for four years and then gone again. I'm just, that just doesn't interest me. It just doesn't motivate me at all. So maybe some form of that, you got to go with your personality and you got to know who you're speaking to, but just tell people, listen to me, if we're just going to talk about this from a strictly political secular view, I just don't find it all that compelling. You know, I'm interested in what Jesus would expect of me. Now I'm going to just give you now this whole can of worms potentially don't mean to open one, but I'm going to give you one because this is one that everybody knows is a hot button flash topic. Okay. Abortion. I'm not going all the way down the line with it, but this is my point. When Christians start having a conversation about what to do about abortion, almost the only thing I hear Christians say is vote this way or that way. That's ridiculous. There is a Christian response to what we see happening. And depending on some heathen, one or the other, to deal with this is not the response that I would get from my Bible, okay? There are things that Christians should be doing. So if you separate the, the, the particular issue that you're talking about from your political views, and when you vote, of course, you're not, people say they're voting for one issue, that's fine, but there's a lot more than one issue that's out there. So if somebody's one issue and somebody else's one issue might not be the same. What if Christians just, just put all of the political stuff to the side and said, hey, what can we do as followers of Christ about this issue? Boy, I think we could really get something done. The reason we can't is because Satan has convinced us that we should depend on his people to fix our problems. That's, that's, that's what I see. Now, I use that one because everybody's already onto that one. And there's a million other ones. And that's the way I'm saying we should be thinking through all of these. We should be thinking, what can we do as the hands and feet of Jesus to deal with these issues. And if we look at the church as the organization to bring about Jesus' will, we won't depend on Black Lives Matter or Antifa or Democrats or Republicans because that's not the organization God gave us. Brother, I am very appreciative of your time. I am very thankful for your honesty and your, your great encouragement and advice um, I know I've learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure, what about you all? Yeah. They're nodding their heads back here. Uh, and so at least the, the, uh, we have to keep it under a certain number in here, uh, and, uh, but we, we got a good crew here that, that is very appreciative of your time. I wanted to uh, let, uh, oh, we got a thank you from somebody uh, sending a message here too. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that if you uh, happen to be a college student in Columbus, Ohio, uh, we've got a student center on 12th Avenue right across the street from the uh, UDF parking lot. Uh, so you can get an ice cream there and come on over, uh, which I think is what we're going to do <laughs> as soon as we're finished here. Uh, but we would love to have you here. And we have the Church of Christ at 1130 Fissinger Road in Columbus. If you're local, we'd love to have you. Uh, we've got a lot of videos on YouTube. We've been uploading a lot of classes and things like that. We would love to, to be able to share some of those things with you. Um, and uh, please, everybody, um, if you are a member of the church, and even if you're not, you just want to see how Christians handle this, I very, very much uh, appreciate Melvin's work on this book. It's there in black and white. Uh, remember, if you're a college student, uh, the first 30 people that RSVP get a free copy of this. So that nice. Uh, I'll uh, send out an email to you all about that later on. So um, I believe that's all we've got. Melvin, any final words? No, thank you guys for, uh, for putting this on. Thank you to everybody who has uh, participated and joined in to think about these things. And my encouragement is always do not be weary in well-doing. Mm. Okay. These things are not easy all the time, but um, progress can be made and more progress will be made if we just continue to, to do what we can in Jesus name the way he wants it done.